it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing my buddy for probably three decades, Dr. Kim Cooch. He received his undergraduate degree from West Minister College in Utah and then completed his DMD at University of Oregon School of Dentistry in 1979. He is an inventor holding numerous patents in dentistry, product consultant, internationally recognized speaker, is past president of the American uh, or the Academy of Laser Dentistry and the World Congress of Minimally Invasive Dentistry. He has also served on the board of directors for the World Clinical Laser Institute and the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. As an author, Dr. Cooch has published over 100 articles and abstracts on minimally invasive dentistry, carries risk assessment, digital radiography, and other technologies in both dental and medical journals and contributes chapters to numerous textbooks. He co-authored Balance, a textbook on dental decay with 100,000 copies in print, and wrote the Rough World series, a young adult science fiction trilogy. He acts as a reviewer for several journals, including the Journal of American Dental Association and Compendium. Dr. Cooch also serves as CEO of Dental Alliance Holdings, LLC, manufacturer of the Carry Free System, and Remnant Media. As a clinician, he is a graduate mentor and scientific advisor of dental caries at the prestigious Coist Center. Dr. Cooch maintains a private practice in Albany, Oregon. My God, Kim, you are an amazing man. You have always been at the front of every parade. I mean, anytime I ever went to a parade, you were always in the front. You're always uh, on the leading edge, between bleeding edge and leading edge. That's where you've been your whole life. Yeah, it's an interesting place to be at times, Howard, let me tell you. So, um, you know, I know you're passionate about dental caries and Canberra and the medical management model of diagnosing and treating dental caries. It seems yeah. like it seems like the reality is, I don't want to throw my homies under a bus, but what percent of dentists just see a cavity and treat it like an engineer, a civil engineer, and just mechanically remove the decay and, and repatch it with pavement? Way too many. What percent you know, would you say, though? Ah, oh, golly. Um, probably 95, 6%, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, yeah it's true. It's true. Yeah. And the same percent treat TMJ just by taking an upper impression and making an eye guard. Yeah. I mean, um, it's just, a, it, you know, Howard, our, our profession is so focused on restorative and the surgical approach to care that, um, you know, it's just ingrained in us. And, and I think it, it, it all goes back to dental school, you know. Uh, we were up there on the fourth floor being taught microbiology, and then they take you down to the clinic floor and they put a drill in your hand. And, and you know, so it's kind of, you understand where the disease is coming from, but the approach is just taught to us. It, it, we're just buried in this restorative model. And so, you know, I don't fault anybody. It's how what we were all trying. That's what I was trying to do. It's the way we're all trained. Although that's changing in the dental schools now, um, but it's just, it's like the treatment of periodontology, same thing. I mean, we all get so focused on that, we forget to stop and go back and go, wait a minute, what caused this disease in the first place, and shouldn't we maybe think about treating that instead? And a lot of it's driven by health insurance codes. I mean, these hospitals will get $100,000 to do a quadruple bypass from Medicaid and Medicare, and then they'll get $25 to have a, a, pay, a doctor exam. So yeah, I mean, so, so basically, if you want to pay for the hospital, every hospital administrator says if they don't do three major surgeries a day, they can't pay any of their bills. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, a lot of it is driven by cost, right? And so we've never been reimbursed as a profession for our, really for our diagnostic skills and our knowledge. And we're, we're only reimbursed really on, and I, and I think, you know, um, that's a major problem for us is. You know, it just goes back to we get paid for doing a filling. We don't get paid for teaching the patient how to floss, right? Exactly. Uh, we, don't get, we don't get paid for doing uh, nutrition uh, counseling and what have you to help patients, you know, correct their health or, or get healthy. We just get paid for um, things that you can show that you did, you know, on an x-ray that the insurance company can verify that you did something. And so, you know, that's a real cha challenge for us, I think, is just the insurance side of that whole deal. So talk about Canberra. What, what is it? So Canberra is just an acronym for the, uh, that model, that philosophy of treating dental caries, um, starting with a risk assessment, trying to identify what caused the disease, and then trying to manage and you know, mitigate those risks for the patient to get them back to a state of health. And so, I mean, it's as simple as that. And, um, but we've made it real. I would, I would say, Howard, our, our biggest flaw is that we we came out of the gate and made it really complicated to start with and it really started in academia and, and with research and you know anytime 
you 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 put something in the hands of the academics and the researchers and the engineers, it's going to be way more complicated uh, than it needs to be, and it's more complicated than I think people could integrate into their practice. I I go back and look at some of the early recommendations and things we did, and it's like it's no wonder people struggled with it and then just gave up on the entire concept because it was too complicated. So I spent the last 15 years trying to simplify it, not to the point that you know it it waters it down to the point it doesn't have value, but to simplify it enough so that you and I can go into our practice every day and do this and have it be effective and, and make it simple to do. So where are you at with camera now, which is uh, carries management by risk assessment? Yep. So where I'm at with it now, Howard, is um, I try to teach. The thing I've been doing for the last three or four years is trying to teach dentists, you know, it's the John Coyce kind of principle, diagnose them at hello. Right. If you look at the patient and just have a conversation with them in the chair, we know what the major risk factors are for dental caries. You know, number one is number one is saliva. And for most patients now, that's medication related. We've got 70 percent of our uh, of our entire population in the U.S. take a, one prescription medication per day. And that's a that's across what all, percent? Age, all age demographics. 50% take two or more and 20% take five or more. And I mean, you see these people every day come into your dental practice and you sound and they, they start talking and their mouth is dry, right? And so there was a, a study done in the uh, in JADA that was published a few years ago and it was a, a survey on patient self-reporting uh, dry mouth. And it was somewhere around 7%. And we did the same study based on our risk uh forms, carries risk assessment forms, and they came in at 63% of my patients, I self-identify that they feel like they have a dry mouth at some time of the day or night. And, you know, some of that's related to other, you know, general systemic issues or autoimmune stuff, but primarily medications. And Howard, even our kids, we've got like 17 million children in the United States taking anti uh, psych psychiatric drugs. Uh, anti-anxiety drugs, antidepressants, ADHD drugs. I mean, that's the crazy part of this. We got kids that are coming in with dry mouth when they should have typically, you know, you and I struggle with trying to get an isolation in the mouth so you can do any dentistry because there's so much saliva. Now we got kids that have dry mouth. So that's the number one risk factor for dental caries. So, you know, look at them and ask if they have a dry mouth. The second in our caries risk assessment form by survey, and this is this is now over 13,000 patients at six, six different dental practices. 55% of them identified, self-identified that they have a dietary issue. They're eating, either eating too much sugar or they're eating too frequently. They're snacking throughout the day. And I think that's part of our lifestyle as well. But Howard, the American diet, we eat 23 teaspoons of sugar a day. And what, what, I'd, what I'd recommend everybody listening to this podcast is go home tonight, pull out a, a Ziploc baggie, and put 23 teaspoons of sugar in there and see what that looks like. World Health Organization recommends that we should be eating somewhere around two-thirds of one teaspoon per day. And on top of that, we consume the most high-fructose corn syrup of any country on the planet at 51 pounds per person per year. So we've got a huge dietary risk, and it's based on primarily on the amount of sugar or the frequency we're eating. So, you know, you start asking people, you know, you know, we have the risk assessment form that identifies that as well. The third major risk factor is bacteria. And typically you see these people, they come in, they got all over their teeth. It's a, primarily a home care situation or they've got the wrong bacteria growing on their teeth. And then the fourth one is kind of the fourth risk factor really in my mind is genetics. And that's kind of a wild card. I can't diagnose, Howard, what your risk genetically is for dental caries. There are a few patterns we've identified, and there will be a time someday that we'll be able to, to probably diagnose that. But in the meantime, so those are like the four usual suspects typically that I see in my practice. And if I can simplify it to like your major problem here is, is not enough saliva, then I, then I know how to help you resolve that or mitigate that. If it's a dietary issue, I know, I know I need to focus on that. If it's a bacterial issue, we know how to help you with that as well. And if it's genetic, I can't do anything but just talk to you about wellness and making sure that you're, you have a healthy diet and you're trying to be effective. And so if we just start thinking about the usual suspects and the major patterns I see for this disease, then it suddenly comes a lot, a lot simpler than looking at these huge flow charts and all of these stratifications 
diagnosis. It's, it's literally, here's what's causing your disease. Let's just break it down and, and simplify it and help you figure out how to solve it. Man, you said so many things. I don't even know where to jump back in. I mean, um, well, I, I, I think Howard for, so for where I'm at in my practice and with that, and a lot of that comes from, you know, I've been doing this for 17 years. So a lot of that is just experience, right? You can sit down and look at a patient, but you know, you pick that up, but you need a carries risk assessment form. If you're going to do this in your practice, I mean, that's, that, that's ground zero, but you need a simple carries risk assessment form that you can have a patient fill out and self identify their risk factors. And there's really important reasons for that. Number one, it, it um, it, when I first started doing this, I was having the hygienist interview the patient. Hygienists don't have time to do that. We've already logged so many things on, on their shoulders that we require them to do in a one-hour appointment. It's, it's, it's seen. So what I did was you take that problem out of the hygiene operatory by having the patient self-identify and, and fill out the form themselves. The other thing that psychologically it happens, when that patient fills out a form and says, yes, I identify this problem that I have, Rather than you going in and sitting down and talking to a patient, telling them they have a problem they don't perceive they have, and they get really defensive and pushed back, they come into that operatory and I've identified this, and now I'm expecting that you're going to talk about this to me. So you need that risk assessment form, but it needs to be simple. And we use it on every patient uh, at least once a year in my practice, every new patient, and, and that gives us the starting point. Um, the other thing I would say that you really need to do is you re need to have your hygienist on board. Like in my practice, um, they do most of the education with the patients. I mean, they've been doing this for a long time now as well, but typically I'll come in to see a new patient or even an existing patient that's now having some issues. And the hygienists have already talked to them. They've helped identify what their risks are. They've uh, asked them specific questions targeted to that. And then they've made recommendations on how they can help mitigate that. And so it's for me, it's just a matter of coming in and kind of confirming that or uh, spending a little more time, you know, with, with my experience with other patients to kind of help that patient figure it out. Um, and you need maybe the 30 second elevator conversation. Like you ask, where am I at with this? Well, it's really just a matter of um, being able to sit down and tell the patient you know, in 30 seconds why we're doing this differently. And that is, you know, we could sit here and, grill and fill your teeth until you, you run out of teeth or die, but it would make a lot more sense to figure out what's causing that problem and fix that instead. And I've not had a patient yet that um, didn't opt to have that done. So that's a real simple, simple process. So that's kind of where I'm at with it today. And talk, talk about how this applies to, I mean, I'm old school. There is there still just three types of cavities, root surface, pit and fissure, and interproximal? Uh, you know, the, the, it's, still... maybe, it's maybe a little more complex than that, but, we'll but go, yeah. We'll go through that because, I, Kim, I'm out here in Phoenix, and it's a big retirement community. And right. I, I've been doing dentistry for 30 years, and when I go into the nursing home and see my patients, they, they, they get one root surface cavity per month. And right. I, I mean, I've never root surface uh, decay spreads like a dam break. I mean, it's crazy. I, I've never seen pit and fissure decay or interproximal decay spread like root surface decay. And then these dentists, um, you know, I mean, so so talk about so talk about the three different types of decay. Or and and let's start with the four hundred pound grill in the room that four and a half percent of us are gonna end up dying in a nursing home. And we're going to get a root surface cavity every month. And I have, got, Kim, I've gone into a dozen nursing homes in Phoenix, and I wanted to see what was going on. They got a CDA who makes 11 to 18 bucks an hour. She's got a whole wing, and she's got to go to each one, give them their meds, brush her teeth. They, she takes a toothbrush. They puts a little pee on there. She goes back and forth the front teeth like six times has her spit in a Dixie cup and she's done. And I'm like, it reminds me of my, my health, my yearly physical exam. My, my physician forever has me open my mouth, puts a popsicle stick in my mouth and says, say, ah, I say, ah, and then he throws the stick away. And I'm thinking, okay, I've been a dentist for three decades. What the hell did you just do? Well, you know, right. so, so talk about, talk about uh, root surface decay. I mean, it's a plague in America. Do you agree or disagree? Oh, I, I, I totally agree, Howard. And if you start, if you go back to the pit and fissure uh, lesions, those are uh, primarily, if we look at the bacteria in each of those different sites, like the one thing that we know now, like we've mapped out geographically in the mouth where the different 
you know, bacteria actually inhabit, the little microcosms that they actually live in. And so those are primarily, mutant streptococci only lives primarily in the, in the pits and fissures. And so that's probably a bacteria that plays a major role there. But when you get to interproximals, you're going to see a lot more of the periodontal bacteria and anaerobic bacteria in that interproximal zone because that's what the environment looks like, right? So you're going to see more lactobacillus and things there. But then you get down onto the root surface and you've got Actinomyces, Israelii. You've got a, a different, a whole different host of bacteria that are living there um, in that environment to begin with. So, you know, the old model of this was a disease of mutant streptococci and lactobacillus, you know, that you can throw that out the window. The challenge we've got is that it's not any specific bacteria anymore. What we know now is that uh, there's a lot of these bacteria, as soon as the mouth becomes acidic, they adapt. They switch it on like 55 different genes. They share genetic information with each other within that biofilm, and they switch on, and they all adapt to become and live, and, and they actually produce acid and become acid uric like, you know, like strep mutans or lactobacillus does. Candida plays a huge role in dental caries. And so you're probably seeing in the nursing home a lot of candida stuff going on as well. And we've just really identified that in the last two or three years. But here's the challenge. You've got all those patients. She, she brushes their teeth, you know, like six strokes and then hands them their meds and has them swallow that. And, you know, there's probably 10 or 12, 15 pills in that, in that cup you know, the one cup, and then they swallow them with the water in the other. So these people don't have any saliva. So we as a profession did a great job over the last, you know, 40 years, our careers, Howard, of being able to save all these teeth. They've got some recession, uh, but now we've got all these exposed root surfaces. These people didn't have, you know, serious dental caries, but now they're on these medications. They don't have any saliva. And now they're sitting in a situation where they're not getting adequate home care as well. The diet, they're probably... I'm going to guess might be better, uh, but you've got you've got the perfect storm. So you've got these exposed root surfaces. You know the uh, if you look at uh, Denton, you know the the critical pH of enamel is 5.5 of of fluorapatite. Once they've been exposed to fluoride on enamel, it's the critical pH is about 4.5. The critical pH of of Denton on those root surfaces is 6.7, and Resting saliva in a healthy person has a pH of 6.75. So you're talking about we've got no room for error. And then you have those exposed root surfaces. You've got the lack of saliva. You pull the saliva out of the equation. Saliva is super saturated with hydroxyapatite nanoparticles and fluorapatite nanoparticles. And the body maintains the teeth by having them constantly bathed in a basic, super saturated solution of the mineral that they're made out of them. Without that, we wouldn't have teeth. And without that, that's why these patients in the nursing home are, are breaking down so rapidly. But it's a whole different group of bacteria that are causing that that are in the pin fissure series. So you, you've got not only three different types of cavities, you've actually got three different probably ecological biofilms that are responsible for that. And then some of the most current research we got going on is indicating that not only do we know that these bacteria within the biofilm communicate with each other, they communicate with our host cells. Like this biofilm is so integral as part of our body that our host cells are communicating with the biofilm as well. So there's a lot going on there. And I, you know, I don't have an answer for it, Howard. I mean, I, you know, the one thing I'm using a lot in those situations is silver diamine fluoride. I mean, I, I'm, you know, it's like, uh, it's hope and pray, you know, put a little silver diamine fluoride on it and, and uh, hope that you can harden those lesions up because it's like, I don't know what we're going to do for all those people. And it's so dangerous. I mean, when you look at the only publicly traded corporate dental offices around the world, they don't even allow general sedation for anyone over, under 13 or over 65 because that, that, those are the high danger zones. And in America, oh, yeah. they're dragging all these two-year-olds to an operating room. And it seems like once a quarter, that turns out really bad and is splashed all over social media. Well, and that just happened, I think, you know, in May. And, you know, and, and here's the challenge, Howard. If you're in that restorative model, I mean, this is the statistic that, that I think bothers me. You take that child that's high, high dental caries risk. I've got, you know, it used to be called early childhood caries. You know, now it's called severe early childhood caries because they have so many lesions. And some of it is educational driven. You know, some of it is, is uh, socioeconomic driven. Uh, but you take that child to the OR, you put them out, 
you do that, restore all their teeth. That's costs on average about costs the system about twelve thousand dollars to do that. Do you know what the average retreatment time on that same kid is going back to the OR? What's that? Twenty months. That's so sad. Our, this is what I challenged our pediatric, you know, side of our profession with. How many times do you have to take the same child back to the same OR every twenty months to do the same thing before you stop and say, this this doesn't work. You know, what we're doing here isn't working for this kid. This doesn't make sense. And you're putting them at risk. I mean, you know, we lost that child in California, just that little girl, three-year-old uh, in May or early June. And it's like, I can't imagine the horror of being a pediatric dentist that day that that happened to, or the anesthetist or anesthesiologist. I cannot imagine how, because by and large, that's a preventable disease. And so you lost a three-year-old, uh, and this happens all the time. You're absolutely right. We lose them. This happens every year. We're losing children in the United States to complications, morbidity, mortality from the anesthesia from a disease that could have been prevented. And that, that's what drives me nuts. So what would you do if you're um, a dentist listening to this and uh, your, uh, your, your mom is 88 years old she has, and she's in a nursing home. She has rheumatoid arthritis and she knows she's going to get the 30-second toothbrush uh, every night. What, what would your solution be for the nursing home? You know, and I see these patients – too, Howard, right? And so uh, I'm just trying to help these people exit this life with as little pain and need for more surgical restorative procedures as possible, right? Just trying to ease them to the grave. Uh, that's what I'd want for my own mom. Uh, you know, that's what I want for me, hopefully. God, I, God forbid that we end up there, but I hope uh, I get more than, you know, six swipes with a toothbrush when I'm there, but, but that's the reality, right? So uh, for that patient, uh, try and, and, and you certainly want to use, you know, I developed a whole line of products that, uh, that act like saliva and that, that are alkaline. And that you're, are talking, you're talking about your website, carryfree.com? Yeah, at carryfree.com. And so, you know, we have products there that we know really help and really work for patients like that. So, you know, they're saturated xylitol. So we're throwing, you know, every strategy that we can. They're only getting six strokes with the brush, but at least I'm using a product I know that it's 5,000 parts per million in Florida. I'm doing everything I can from a product side. You know, on the other side of that, then it's really a matter of let's try and get some silver diamond in Florida and these lesions and try and arrest that, you know, for the patient in the mouth. Talk it's, about a brand. You know, what, 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 where, do you, where do you get the silver diamine fluoride? So uh, Advantage Arrest. Advantage and that's company, Arrest. So they can go look that up. Um, and there's a code for that. We even have a code. Now, not every insurance, and a lot of those people don't have insurance in the first place, but that's a D1354 code. So we're starting slowly, Howard, to get some codes. Um, we've got uh, Carrie's risk assessment codes uh, that I helped write, the DO601, 602, 603 codes. Uh, we're starting slowly to see um, reimbursement for uh, for different procedures like that, that are that are minimally invasive related, and Delta is actually has a couple of beta test sites right now. Is that, when you, hang on a second. When you said yeah. Advantage Arrest, is that ElevateOralCare.com? Yeah, exactly. That's Elevate Oral Care. Yep, okay. exactly. Come on, I'm getting old and senile. You can't play tricks on me like that. But, sorry, sorry. But uh, that's so, the product name. Elevate Oral Care, I think, is the company name. So, so talk about CarryFree.com. When, when. When did that come along in your journey, and what's uh, um, how's that going? And and t talk about that a little bit. It's going really well. It's it's interesting, Howard. Um, I came home. I'd done a bunch of lectures in Australia. I was there for about five weeks. This was back in two thousand and one, and I came home from that. I spent a lot of time with he and No down there. He was at University of Adelaide at the time, and I came home from there with a different mindset, like. You know, I, I've been involved in lasers and air abrasion and minimally invasive dentistry for 30 years now. But I really came home for the first time from that trip and looked at dental caries like a disease and not like a series of holes in teeth. And so I got home and I contacted Doug Young at UOP and John Featherstone, uh, who probably has led this whole Canberra movement. Uh, he's dean currently at UCSF, but he's retiring at the end of the year. But those two men really helped shape my mind around how we do this. 
And so I started, I was about determined I was going to figure out how to do this in private practice. So I started in my own practice at that point in time. And I was using chlorhexidine, and then I switched as an antimicrobial rinse, and then I switched to povidone iodine, for crying out loud, 10% povidone iodine, which everybody should at least switch with one time just to know what that experience is like. But I, I tried those for a couple of years, and I really wasn't getting the results that I wanted. And so Doug and I got together, and we spent a weekend. And I said, you know, we, there's got to be something better. I mean, these things work, but but they don't work as well as I'm, you know, they're not doing what I want. I want a knockout punch here. And so we started digging through all the scientific literature, and we found this paper by Philip Marsh back in the late 1980s, 88, 89. Philip Marsh and David Bradshaw demonstrated that it's not um, – the sugar availability that's actually causing the selection for these acid uric bacteria, it's actually the acid itself. So, you know, I told Doug, if he's right, then we should get the highest pH product we can find, start using our patients and see if that changes the biofilm and if it changes their incidence of dental caries, changes the, the clinical outcome. So I went to Walmart. We literally bought everything on the shelf. And I went home and tested. And I had a, you know, I, for my first company, I still had a scientific lab. I had a high sensitive scientific pH meter. So we tested all these products. And I was horrified when I just, I had no idea. When I discovered the pH of these products is like, well, one of them still holds a record at 3.13. So you're trying to get rid of acid uric bacteria with a product that has a pH of three. And most of them are between four and five and even below 5.5. And you look at that and go, well, here I am trying to get rid of these things and I'm bathing them in the acid I'm trying to get rid of. And we know that the body does this with a, you know, your stimulated saliva has a pH of 8.0. So I told Doug, I, you know, if he's right, we need to raise the pH on a product and try that and see what happens. And so uh, we did, I switched to sodium hypochlorite as a, uh, as an antimicrobial treatment. And then we started making products that were just had a real high pH. And I, it, it's like, three or four days, I saw a change in my own mouth in terms of the biofilm when I woke up in the morning. So that's how the, all we did was copy nature and then try to improve on it. But that's, uh, so I told Doug, it's like, I really didn't want to start another dental company, but at this point in my life, but um, I know how to do that. I know how to interact with the FDA. I know how to, to file patents. I know how to build companies. So you know what, nobody else is going to do this. So let's start. And then it took us about four years to figure out how to stabilize uh, a, an alkaline product for shelf life stability for like at least a couple of years. So that's not an easy task in itself. And, and one of the reasons so many things are acidic on all of our products and food is because it's easy. Once you acidify it, it's pretty shelf stable. So once you take it into the alkaline range, you know, a lot of things want to grow in it. So it took us a few years to solve that. But once we got that solved and, you know, we started launching the products and it's grown, um, Internationally, we're right now expanding into Japan, helping teach preventive dentistry and, and caries management in that in that society. But you know, so we've done really well in the U.S. and Canada, Mexico, New Zealand, Australia, uh, a couple of countries in Europe, and now uh, now Japan. So the company is doing very well. It's growing. Uh, we've trained probably six thousand dentists in the U.S. alone on how to do caries management, but. Um, and, a, and a, a couple of thousand of them I know do it on a regular basis in their practice. But when you look at the whole landscape of dentists in the United States, Howard, that's, you know, we're talking about 96% are, this isn't on their radar. So you have, um, you built us a course on Canberra, uh, Made Simple. Does that explain yep. all your products and all that? Yeah, pretty much. And if not, uh, the website, we just got a brand new website we launched, which has a lot of video on it, has a lot of explanation. And then if there's anybody that's interested in this or learning more about it, uh, we do free trainings. I mean, we do uh, webinar-based trainings to the office and train the staff at the same time. So, uh, you know, we, we train a lot of offices like every month. And like I say, my trainers there, have, and that's free, that's a free service, um, we've trained I know personally, we've trained over 6,000 practices in the U.S. And Holy so they have moly. more what, what, what are your, what are, what are the, my homie's favorite products? What, what are you selling the most of? What, what do they like the most? Our number one, our number one product is this CTX4 gel. And that's a 5,000 part per million fluoride gel. CTX? Uh, CTX, Carries Treatment. That's an acronym for Carries Treatment. 
uh, the, the 5,000 part gel. Uh, so it's 5,000 parts sodium fluoride. Um, it is saturated in xylitol, which is close to 30% xylitol uh, in the product. It has a pH of 9.0, and then it also has an optimum amount of uh, nanoparticles of hydroxyapatite. So it's got four strategies there, uh, you know, trying to help create a, 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 an environmental ba healthy balance in the mouth. Probably this, our second most popular product is the CTX4 rinse, and that's a 0.05% fluoride rinse. Also has xylitol in it, and it also um, has sodium hypochlorite in it. It has a pH of 10.5. What's the 4 stand for on the CTX4? Okay, so the 4 stands for there's four different strategies there. So we have some CTX2 products that would have just a high pH and xylitol. A CTX3 product might have, like we have a CTX3 gel and a CTX3 rinse. That would have um, a high pH. It would have xylitol and have nanoparticles of HA, but it doesn't have fluoride. So when you get to the CTX4 product line, they've got high pH, uh, fluoride, xylitol, and then also uh, nano HA. So we just wanted to kind of differentiate. Nano have, HA for hydroxyapatite? Yep, yep. And it's uh, 20 nanometers, uh, average particle size, which is exactly uh, biomimetic for what is in your saliva. Now, did you, can you only buy it on carryfree.com or does... Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Uh, so it's available on Amazon. It's available at uh, carryfree.com. Uh, you can buy it directly from the company. Uh, so we have offices that like to stock and supply it. I do that in my own practice. Then we've got practices that don't want to handle any products or do any of that. And you can just send the patient either to our website or to Amazon. And how is now, it, deal how is it Amazon, dealing? Go ahead. On Amazon, they can't buy the 5,000 part per million gel, and they can't buy the, uh, the uh, sodium hypochlorite rinse. From dealing with Amazon, do you think they're going to give uh, these distributors like Shine and Patterson and Benko and Burkhardt uh, some challenge? I think they're already giving them a challenge, Howard. I mean, they, in my mind, they're the Walmart. I've been saying this for a couple of years. Fit over 50% of all internet sales for everything that's sold on the internet, over 50% are from Amazon. They have 50% internet market share for sales. I mean, they're bigger than Walmart in terms of, I don't know what, what Walmart's market share is in terms of, you know, retail. Uh, maybe you know, but, it, but it, I, I'm sure they're not 51%. I, mean, and I, of, I like every, that one-stop shopping. I hate going to websites and you got to enter your credit card and address and all this crap. And you go to Amazon and that's the item you want. In fact, what's funny for me, I'm an old dog. Um, I used to send a text or an email to my assistant telling me I needed something. But right. it's actually now for me faster and easier to pull out my iPhone, find it, and then click. hit the one button click. And one it's click on and my it's porch. There, the with next Amazon day. Prime, it's there in two days. Right. No. So, I mean, we all do that. I mean, it's, I check Amazon Prime before I do any before I leave the house. Right. So I think you're going to see more and more growth of that in the future. There's a lot of dental different dental materials and supplies in there. I, I think that. Um, yeah, I think it's going to give them. Uh, a I want you to talk about an, um, two of some more of your ingredients. I think they understand the NHA, the nano HA and the high pH, but xylitol, I mean, um, it's confusing because so many of your patients come in, they say, Oh yeah, I only chew gum with xylitol, but is there a, a, a dose that you think is therapeutic versus a dose that's marketing and advertising and yeah, all these products based, based, at Walgreens? Based on the research, Howard, you really need to have seven tenths to one gram per stick of gum and you need to chew at least five of those a day. Um, so literally, if you're going to have xylitol, you need somewhere around five to seven grams of xylitol per day. That's kind of like an optimal dose. You get a lot higher. You get past about 10 or 11 and you start to get some gastric symptoms if you swallow it, uh, you know, maybe some diarrhea up in the 20 range. But so that five to seven seems to be optimal in terms of uh, treating dental caries. Uh, xylitol, you know, I did a whole webinar last year on xylitol. It's pretty interesting. Um, the whole process is a genetically modified corn, is a tree bark. I mean, you get into a lot of, and I understand people being should be concerned about all those questions, but uh, they use heavy nickel uh, in the process of it. Uh, although at the end, it's just, I mean, this is just sugar. It's a sugar alcohol, five carbon sugar alcohol. 
and there isn't any heavy nickel in it. There isn't any of that. Um, and so we have really good research on it. You had the xylitol, the, uh, the study that came out of the exact study. There was the xylitol uh, adult dental carry study that came out. They had, I think, 675 adults uh, in that study. They gave them five xylitol mints a day, Howard, for uh, three years. And at the end, that was the entire treatment. These were high caries risk patients. Uh, they were adults. And at the end of the treatment, there was no outcome. And so that got published in the New York Times. Every, all the anti-xylitol people came out of the woodwork. See, I, I got more email response from that than anything I've done in my life. And everybody said, see, it doesn't work. It was on all the major. It was on CNN. Uh, xylitol doesn't work. It doesn't help treat dental caries. So that was published in, J in JADA like in January of 2013. In June of 2013, they did secondary analysis of that data. And this is where it gets interesting. Those patients that you and I were talking about that have those lesions uh, on the root surfaces in the nursing home, right? People that had primarily class five root surface lesions, those five xylitol mints a day reduced their caries incidence by 40% which I can't even name anything else that's ever been studied that reduced anybody's caries rate by an average of 40%. I mean, most of the fluoride studies come in around 28 to 32 at best. Uh, the camera study that uh, Fe Featherstone did came in at 27%. I mean, 40% from five xylitol mints a day. So when you talk about what would you do for your mom in that nursing home, make sure that she has cases of xylitol lozenges, you know, next you know, she can eat five, limit to her to five, right? But have five xylitol mints a day. That re, that alone reduced the caries rate by 40%. So there's a lot of research on xylitol, xylitol gum, you know, transferring bacteria from other child. There's enough scientific information and in Cochrane study to go talk about that all day long. But uh, xylitol is a, a fairly still somewhat controversial subject, which surprises me. Anyway. Well, let, let's go to the... 10x, uh, let's 10x the controversy on xylitol and move to fluoride. Uh, okay. I mean, um, um, I mean, there's even dentists on Facebook and Dental Town that don't believe in water fluoridation. Um, there's a lot of patients who say, uh, you know, they want, uh, they ask for a natural toothpaste, and I, a natural is such a red flag for me. I always, I always say, you mean natural like HPV or natural like HIV? Wh which kind of natural? Are you talking about uh, a natural, you know, a, a supernova exploding star, which makes all the ingredients for an amalgam? That, you know, an amalgam is completely natural, made in a supernova exploding star of mercury, silver, zinc, copper, whereas these tooth colored fillings are made by these men in lab coats and with beakers and chemicals. And then, the, and then they're so stupid. They always go, Oh, well, I want the tooth colored one, dude. I thought you just said natural. And now we're at now, right. now we're like, screw natural. We want tooth colored. So, so how do you deal? And you're in no offense. I don't want to offend you, but you're in Oregon, <laughs> Oregon. That, that's some of the biggest nature lovers, crystal conventions. I mean, am I not our, right? Our, I mean, compare Oregon I, I to practice. Oklahoma. I, I practice in the people's, what we lovingly refer to as the People's Republic of Oregon. You know, I, I, you know, and it's true. I mean, I have patients that come in, and I've got a new product, actually, I'll be launching in the first quarter of next year that will be virtually, I think you're going to freak out when you see it, because it is going to be all natural, right down to bamboo particles for the abrasive. I mean, you'll be able to eat this stuff. There'll be no preservative and I mean, I'm pretty excited about that for that because that's a growing segment of the market, right? And I have patients that come in and they say, no, I don't want any fluoride. Well, what am I going to do for that patient? That's my major treatment weapon, right? Uh, so if I've got something that has, I know it's got an elevated pH uh, and I know that I'm giving them xylitol and I know that I'm, I'm giving them some nano HA, the minute, you know, that they have a dry mouth, uh, having that nano HA kind of goes away because suddenly it's not in the saliva because they don't have enough saliva. So I want to add that back to the equation and they, they're, they're tying my hands by not being able to, you know, add any fluoride to the situation. The fluoride is a controversial subject and I kind of understand, I mean, I have some own misgivings about it, Howard. If you go back to 1945, you know, in, in Michigan, you know, that was ground zero for the first water fluoridation and it worked tremendously at one part per million right out of the gate, right? Um, and so it worked through your children, my children are probably, I don't you know about your kids, but my kids are all decay-free, right? My grandchildren are starting to get cavities. 
So it's like it worked for an entire generation, and it's almost like the biofilm, the bacteria have learned how to adapt and survive and change. That's what bacteria do, right? I mean, they know how to do that. And the best way to, to give them a chance to do that is to put them and give them a very small dose over a long period of time. So we might have been better off in the early days rather than fluoridating the water at one part per million using the, you know, the 50,000 part per million varnish just on the people that needed it. Uh, you know, use the big gun and come in with a heavy dose on those selected and targeted individuals. Um, I don't know. I mean, I can't prove that, and but I can understand that that from an ecological or, or a biofilm standpoint, that could possibly happen. One of the things that's happened in our children in the last 20 years, the decay rate went up double digits for for about uh, four reporting years well, with the uh, with the health organization here in the U.S. But uh, in the last, and this study just came out in the last 10 years, it's flatlined. It's not getting worse, but it's not improving. Although we do from the CDC, we do get data that we do believe fluoride reduces the decay rate about 27% in the country annually. So with the rampant decay that we're seeing today, I mean, Howard, you're seeing stuff you didn't see when you graduated from dental school. I mean, I know you are in your practice because I am too, right? Right. And so we've got a decay epidemic that, and, and lesions and things that I've never seen in my life. Um, I'm seeing more of these NCCLs than I've ever, I spend, I, I can't tell you how many of those I treat like every day. And it's like, we have all these theories on what's causing that, but you know, just getting back to the fluoride. So on the flip side of that, we have all this research that indicates that fluoride helps reduce the decay rate and I'm still using it and I still believe in it, but I've got patients that won't accept it. So I've got to try and come up with the best alternatives for them uh, to help get their mouth to a healthy balance. So that's what we're working I on. I do agree that when a patient comes in and they don't agree, you, you, you're still their dentist. I mean, when they show up and they say, you know, you know I'm still their dentist. But one thing I've always thought about fluorine is um, on the periodic table, you know, it's second from the right. It's in group 17. But it's uh, the halogen element is in, uh, includes fluorine. Then you drop down. It's chlorine, then bromine, then iodine, and then acetine. But I, you see it in swimming pools where they – um, I think it's so funny how they're so, well, it's not funny, just um, they're so concerned about the fluorine in the water, but right beneath right. that is chlorine. And there's, I oh, mean, no. if you think fluoride in the water is toxic, you've got almost nothing to stand on. But when you look at the levels of chlorine used, you got a lot of stuff to stand on, but they don't talk about chlorine. And then these swimming pool companies, I'm in Arizona where if you don't have a swimming pool, you know, you better be a lizard. And so they're advertising chlorine free pools but what do they do they just drop down seven column 17 and drop right down to bromine and i always wondered if uh uh if you don't like fluoride uh maybe a chlorine mouth rinse remember, remember when omar reed came out with a chlorine oh yeah uh, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. radcliffe you know uh, yeah, yeah. it's like well if you don't like fluorine why don't you just go get a glass of swimming pool water every morning out of your jacuzzi and swish with right. chlorine you know well uh, it's interesting and then we've i mean most of our uh Water supplies are chlorinated. That's how we make, you know, reduce the bacteria levels there, right? And keep, uh, we chlorinate water. So even our drinking water. So um, it's a challenge, you know, and you, again, like you say, they're still my patient. I'm still their dentist. You know, they've said, okay, I'm not going to accept this. So then I, I want to be able to say, okay, so I've got these other strategies that I can help you with. Hey, so, where, where, where did he, where's he in Noah now? Last I heard he was a dean of some dental school in the Middle East. Yeah. And I think he's still there. I mean, he went from Adelaide up to Singapore, back to uh, Brisbane, and then I think he's in Dubai or someplace. Last I heard, I haven't talked to him for a couple of years now. Yeah, I, I um, on your recommendation, I flew him down to uh, Phoenix myself from um, Adelaide, Australia, to lecture to our study club. But you know, you mentioned he, uh, he was in Adelaide, then he went to Singapore, now he's in Dubai. But you know, when I was lecturing in Singapore and Tokyo, it was very interesting how Dennis would show me how the disease missing in filled teeth was going down equally in both of those great civilizations, but one had water fluoridation in Singapore and one in Tokyo didn't. And in Japan and Singapore, they were convinced that the, that the, the key was getting parents to teach home care to their children. I mean, you're getting, like, like you say, a more holistic approach, talking about diet and home care. That was what important, not some magic splash of one part per million fluoride in the water. Well, I think, you know, Howard, Honestly, if, if you if you have an effective diet, so you're not eating sugar, you're not drinking, you know, the six big gulps of Mountain Dew every day. <laughs> uh, and if you have really good home care, 
you can have a healthy mouth without any fluoride at all, right? I mean, I, I, we would expect that. But, um, yeah, so we're using fluoride to kind of overcome some of those challenges, and in, and in part it has. But, I mean, you look at it, I don't know, Howard, my own experience was like when I first got out of dental school, we had, you know, the foam, you know, first came out, the fluoride foam, right? And I'd get a little kid come in that had, uh, you know, three or four lesions, and I'd give him a fluoride treatment in the office, and, boy, everything came to a dead halt. Right. And now it's like these kids are coming in and I'm painting 50,000 part money in Florida on your teeth four times a year and it's not even slowing it down. So it's like something has changed in my mind. And, and you know, where that it, some of that is diet. Our diet has changed in the U.S. with all the sugar. I mean, there's a lot of those different major risk factors that go into that. Interesting in, in Japan, um, you know, I'm spending quite a bit of time there in the last year, but the interesting part about Japan is the government hasn't paid for preventive dentistry, so consequently there really hasn't been any, right? You could go get your teeth cleaned if you called up and asked for a cleaning, but they didn't pay for that. And so suddenly they're starting to pay for that, and so there's this huge interest in the dentist that we want to know how to set up a recare system. We want to know how to create these programs and systems for in our practice and at the same time get more involved in, in preventive dentistry as well, so uh, like Canberra. And looking at caries management. So there's a major push in Japan right now going on because they've got, as the Western diet, I think, is probably spread around the planet. Oh, my God. You know, you know who's these people, the, you know who they look hitting different, the worst? right? You they, know who's oh, hitting God, the worst? Oh, yeah. The Middle it's East. The worst. You, look, you look at it, and I, from going to Australia for the last 40 years and teaching down there, I used to go down there, and these people were lean and fit. And I'd always come home and go, Wow. You know, something is wrong with, Amer you know, Americans. And when you're gone for a while, you come home and you're looking to go, you know, we're not healthy here. And now Australians look like, you know, 40 years later, you go walk down the street and there's a burger. And you know, not to pick on any particular thing, but there's all of these food chains from the Western diet. And now Australians look like Americans. Right. Kim, and I, Kim, when like, you go when you go to Dubai and Kuwait, there is a fast food restaurant every hundred yards. I mean, it is amazing. You know, and, and so that diet is, uh, it's, it's created some, you know, some health issues for us. I think, you know, systemic health issues for us here in the U.S., but certainly, you know, contributed, our diets contributed to our overall health and well-being as well. Kim, you've been a mentor of mine since 1987. For 30 years, you've been a mentor. Who turned me on to intro cameras? You. Who turned me on to minimally invasive dentistry? You. Who turned me on to air abrasion? You. Who turned me on to glass onomer? You. You've been a big influence in my life. So I want to go through those four. I'm a big believer in digital x-rays because your consumer patient can't read the film. And I like you to talk with your hands with an intro camera in there. What intro camera do you like? Um, I think we've got the digital doc, digital doc right at the moment. Um, Did, digi -doc I, you know, digital doc or digital doc? Digital doc or is it digital doc? Yeah, you know, Howard, I couldn't even tell you off the top of my head. But I tell you what, I, I, there's a lot of really good intro cameras on the market right now. You know, um, any, any you remember any camera. when we started, the first one was $38,000 from oh, Patterson, and it was the size of I a still, refrigerator. I still have my well Talent Reveal cameras because they cost so <laughs> much. They cost so much, Howard, I, couldn't, I just couldn't bear to throw them away. Right. I and still what, have. And what was funny is the, the early bleeding edge adopters like you and um, turned everybody onto this thing. I bought my $38,000 Fuji cam from Patterson. And even though they were only 10,000 the next year, I still made up for it. It's still, you show people with an intro camera that, oh my God, can you do that today? And it's like, I don't know anyone who paid 38 grand for that thing that regretted it. Oh, no. I, I have nobody sent one back that I'm aware of. I mean, I, I have no and, regrets. And, what, and I, I loved air abrasion. My, my assistant, Jan, she is so mad whenever I use air abrasion because it makes a mess. Gosh darn, I love that thing. What, what, what's the status of air abrasion these days? Um, I mean, I think it's it probably kind of plateaued. People don't use it as much as they were probably in the 90s when we were actively involved in manufacturing that uh, those kind of products. But, I mean, I still use it every day. I mean, to what clean are you the using? Is, what was it called, the Mark IV or the... Yeah, I had actually the Mark IV and then the, the Mach 5 and the Mach 6. The Mach 6 was like, the, you know, our best device. Um, you know, I still have a couple of those in my practice. Uh, but again, there's three or four different uh, devices on the market. Uh, the, the one, 
Oh gosh, I'm trying to think here. Um, the prep start, you know, there's a great little device for the money. All right. And they work well. So, Amazing. but again, I, I use it to, to, to clean prep. So I use it for, you know, what's the name of the one you like? I, I think it's prep start prep start. Check that one out. Okay. But, right. uh, but, you know, I use it to clean restorations. I use it to clean preparations. I use it on minimally invasive stuff. You know, it does make a mess, a bit of a mess. That's always been a challenge with it, but there's nothing else like it, you know? I love it, man. I just absolutely love it. Um, yeah. And I want you to talk about another thing. You know, when you, you mentioned he and no, you know, when, when we first met, it seemed like glass animer was only used in Asia. It was only used in Japan, New Zealand, Australia. What's the status of glass animer today? Because a lot of Basically, in a nutshell, a lot of dentists are starting to think, I and mean, I see it on Dental Town Time, that, you know, what we've been doing is making a wooden barn for years and telling them to brush and floss it twice a day, and then it gets eaten by termites. And, you know, what if you made a filling that had more, you know, some, some defense? What, what do you think of these bioactive fillings? What do you think of glass onomer as opposed to just an inert resin filling from Ivoclair or 3M? Um, what, what do you think of their Ivoclair they both 3M are, inert know, versus the, something the bottom line is The bottom line is it's probably more technique-related than it is material-related, particularly when you get into bonding protocols, right? If you don't have good isolation, I don't care what product you're using. And so, um, like, I, I've used glass animers on and off over the last, you know, 30 years. I did a lot of sandwich restorations in the 90s. Uh, yeah. I saw a lot of those fail, right? Uh, because I wasn't treating the rest of the disease and you would actually have mouths that were so acidic that they would dissolve. I saw them dissolve that glass ionomer in the proximal box zone. You know, it's best. It will, it will. We know for a fact that if you've got fluoride in that glass ionomer, it's going to recharge and it's going to put a uh, glass ionomer into the dent. You know, so for terms of preventive secondary decay around lesions, you can't beat glass ionomer, right? Uh, but it, it fails differently. Um, it's going to dissolve slowly. Uh, it fails differently than resins do. So I still use it. Like if you look at glass ionomer. You still use what? I, I use Fuji, Fuji, Fuji products, you know, for glass ionomer. Uh, but then what I've started using, I use, you know, resin modified glass ionomer cement, you know, um, Unisem. I, I use Unisem now to cover the dent uh, in those areas. And then I play, and then I go through my entire bonding protocol uh, and use, you know, composites on top of that. That seems to work better than the glass ionomer did. Now, I still use glass ionomer selectively on the high carriage risk patient for like a pit and fissure saline, um, or I'll use it on a high risk carriage patient as a interim restoration. They work extremely well for that. Um, but if you take glass ionomer or a resin sealant, they both work, but they fail differently. You know, the glass ionomer is going to completely fail by bulk fracturing. And the whole thing will come out. There won't be any decay there. The enamel matured, but you're going to lose the entire sealant. If you use a resin sealant, the sealant's going to stay, but it's going to leak. And then you end up some recurrent, you know, decay underneath the lesion. So if you're going to use sealants, you know, resin sealants, you've got to basically main in the studies, you read the studies, the in you know, part of their protocol is they maintain those sealants. So they reseal, like anytime you see any leakage. Every six months, you're maintaining those sealants, and resins will work that way. So they're going to fail by leakage, and the, whereas the glass ionomer sealant is going to fail by, by fracture. You know, and the same is true for resins and glass ionomers and other restorative areas in the mouth. So I think it's as its technique is so critical um, with both of those materials. So that's what I would that would be my best recommendation. Well, uh, and we, we, if you and I do a podcast, we're going to have a shout out to Stewie. I think we're going to hurt right. his feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart retired this year, although he's still teaching. He's uh, he's still teaching some laser classes, uh, and we got to do a shout out to Stuart. Stuart has been such a dear friend and a great mentor and, uh, to me as well. Uh, and you know, he's practiced almost fifty years uh, chairside, which I, I absolutely admire and respect. Anybody that puts that many years in treating patients and he did it because he loved it. Um, and he retired, but I hear from Stuart every once in a while, but he's doing well, but he's still teaching laser programs. So, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's one of a kind, I tell you. And what about what are the other rat pack, Bill Brown? Yeah. Billy Bob's still around. You know, Bill is still, uh, he's still at BioLays. Um, 
I think, you know, Bill's probably getting closer to retirement, uh, but he's, he's certainly, uh, he's been a great friend and mentor to me as well. One of the smartest people I ever met. So do you own a BioLace? I do, as a matter of fact. Well, we'll talk about that. What, what, what do you think of BioLace? Um, well, I, you know, if you're going to buy a laser in my, you know, our tissue laser, certainly that's the one I've been using for probably 20 years now. Uh, but yeah, I've got their, uh, MD device and I use it. I really like it on, um, uh, minimally invasive restorations, smaller restorations, those class five, those NCCLs, those class five lesions, uh, class threes, class fours. I use it exclusively for that in my practice. So I drag it out and use it every day. And so, I know that Stuart's teaching, Stuart's teaching some uh, periodontal regeneration with it as well. And so I need to learn more about that myself. Um, I mean, you're the, the leader in all this uh, about cavities. Does any of this are uh, transferred to perio? I know specifically with uh, implants, what I'm reading is that within 60 months, 20% of dental implants placed in America have peri-implantitis. And I think, again, you're going back to we haven't diagnosed uh, maybe what caused the periodontal disease or whatever the local and local environmental factors were that helped contribute to that. We know there's a huge genetic component. If you look at dental caries as a disease, uh, it's a biofilm disease. Uh, it has multiple risk factors, and it also uh, has genetic components. Well, so does periodontal disease. In fact, of the 290 diseases that the World Health Organization recognizes and tracks, uh, dental caries is number one in adults. Untreated dental caries is number one, and that's in every country of the world and every age demographic in the world. I mean, woohoo, we are number one. Uh, periodontal disease is number two. So we're talking about two complex biofilm diseases that are, if, if you as a practitioner are struggling with these uh, and feel frustrated from time to time, you should. They're the, they're the two most prominent diseases because they're the hardest to treat. So I think, you know, uh, this whole medical management concept translates to periodontal disease in terms of local factors or environmental factors. Uh, the genetic component there is so big, I think, in, uh, in periodontal disease that I don't know how you overcome all of that. I mean, you know, like John Coy says, teeth aren't for everybody. I mean, I'm not sure I can save that for every single person. But um, I, want you, I want you to talk about one other thing that no one's uh, – that, that a lot of people don't want to accept or talk about or whatever, but – um, you know, kissing, um, I, I have witnessed for three decades where you have someone, they're all through high school. They don't have any cavities. They don't have any bleeding points. Everything's good. They're moving along. All of a sudden he comes in at 23 and he's got four cavities and he's got gingivitis. And I just stand there and look, have you, have you started kissing? Did you get a lover? Are you, are you trading saliva with someone? And he just looks at me like, well, yeah. I mean, I've, and I've seen so many people, but I'll go into dental office in America, and they'll see grandma every three months for her periodontal cleaning. And they haven't seen grandpa one time. And after 10 years, he shows up with a toothache. He's got bombed out molars, nine millimeter pockets. Like, do you think, uh, and look at HPV. I mean, or no, 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 HPV. We know, we know do you think kissing is causing we part of the that We share bacteria, right? And once a biofilm is established, it's really hard to change that biofilm. But so even on a healthy adult, but we get most of our bacteria from our mother. Um, and there was a study done, it's almost 30 years ago. They did a study on periodontal pathogens and bacteria in the mouth. And they took, and this is before we were as good at identifying checkerboarding identity bacteria as we are now, but they took 20 couples blind and they matched all 20 people based on the, the bacteria from their oral biofilms. So whoever you're kissing, uh, if that's a long period of time and you're a long relationship with that person, absolutely, your biofilms are mixing, you know, in the bacteria. And so, so, you're saying, saying, so you're saying your I should get rid of my – so, so you're saying I should get rid of my – healthy, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to start suddenly getting decay if you're kissing somebody that has that. But I, I'd be pretty selective about who I started kissing. So you think I should give away my three cats? Well, you know, you have <laughs> final final question. Final question. Okay, I'm losing my and, power. And uh, and uh, shout out to my mom because you said they got it from the mom. Um, I've had pretty much a Carrie's free life, a Perio free life. Uh, she gave me the fluoride drops and the uh, yeah. the uh, the the when I was a little kid and my five sisters. And uh, you said Stewie um, is uh, done it for fifty years. 
my next door neighbor, Kenny Anderson, who made me a dentist, he just celebrated his 50 years and he's still practicing. And uh, he, he, he says, he says that he thinks if he retired, he'd be bored. You know, he, yeah, he, he I, likes, I, I would be, he likes to get out and do what he loves. Final question. Yeah. You have, um, what is it? Five children, 11 grandchildren, but two of your children became dentists. Um, yep. we just had, uh, 6,000 kids walk out of school, um, you know, uh, last, uh, May and we just had 6,000 new kids just enter, um, uh, dental school. And these podcasts are about a quarter of them are devoured in the schools. Uh, what would advice would you give to the graduating class? Cause sometimes they listen to these podcasts and Kim, I know what they're thinking. I know my homies are thinking, uh, Kim and Howard, they graduated in the glory days and they were lucky and they didn't have student loan debt. They didn't have corporate dentistry. What would you say to those kids coming out of school with all that student loan and debt? They're 25 years old. They're listening to you right now on their hour commute to Aspen. What would you say to them? I would say get involved in Canberra. Like, as soon as possible. Like once you get your patients decay free, instead of putting yourself out of business, that patients, you know, Bob Barkley tried to tell us this in the seventies, patients don't start buying dentistry until they quit getting cavities. And I didn't understand that as a young dentist, but I'm here to tell you when you get your patients decay free and healthy, magical things happen in your practice. So I would get involved in that out of the gate. If you want to be, I have a lot of fulfillment and reward out of your practice, get your patients healthy. And that is, instead of drilling and filling teeth, be focused on what's causing those problems and solve that instead. And you know what's sad is those kids just listening to you, they don't even know who Bob Barkley is. And I don't think, I've been trying to find some VCR tape, some 35 millimeter reel. I want to, do you have any, do you know? You know what, I had a VH tape, you know, I have to look hard. I may have a tape of one of his lectures yet. And I had his textbook, I lent it to a friend and I need to get it back. But I had a copy of his textbook, and it's a very, very interesting read. He Ryan, was where we are right now. He was in 1970. Ryan, we need to take that on. What, what was that? When we did the podcast with uh, Brad Gettleman, at the end of that, we posted the oldest video of a root canal ever known. Can we cut that out and post that on uh, Dentaltown under endodontics and say the oldest root canal ever recorded, um, maybe under uh, history, um, you know, dental. No, no, under endo, the oldest but I thought that was so cool. We we uh, we um, found from the founder of Tulsa Dental Products the oldest root canal ever filmed. Wow! And it was a century old. But I'd like to find some more of these legends, like Bob Barkley. If you ever find anybody, Omar Reed says he thinks he might have some tapes in his garage, but he hadn't found them yet. Uh, it was supposed to be an hour. That's our show, and that we went to an hour six. But Kim, I just want to say seriously, man. Thank you so much for all that you've done for me, my career. Thank you so much for all you've done for dentistry, for posting on Dentaltown, for making online Dentaltown. See, I mean, you've just been a mover and a shaker for since you graduated. And what year did you graduate? 79. 79. My God, seriously, dude. I'm your biggest fan. Howard, Howard you've always been a hero of mine. I was telling your son, Ryan, before you, you came on, you know, you, you've been so good for this profession. I know you, you don't take compliments well. I love sharing the podium with you those years that we spoke together. But, you know, Howard, you have a gift of being able to say things that need to be said in this profession. Um, and you that, that nobody else wants to say. They don't have the nerve to say. And you bring up topics. And I don't know how you do it, man, but you do it. And you do it well. And, I might, you know, you've built such an incredible network. And you have helped so many dentists. And I, little, you've been a hero of mine and a mentor to me and from the business side of this as long as I have known you, Howard. And I love you, man. Well, I love you more. Uh, thanks for the kind words. And you and I and Stuart, we've always told what we feel. I, I think it's a trust deal. I think if I'm going to sit there and put a tie on and lie to you, I'm not a good guy. And then when I take my tie off and tell you what I really think, it offends, you know, a bunch of people. But yep. I'd rather tell you what I thought than lie to you or sugarcoat it. And you and I and Stewie, we always shot from the hip and told you what we honestly thought. And uh, we're all good for the profession. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Hey, thank you, Howard.